Well, here we are today, one week from the Passover. Actually, one week from last night, right? Uh, well, the time has come around once again to the spring of the year, a wonderful time of the year. Life begins in the Northern Hemisphere. It begins, and it's interesting watching it around our own property, how uh, animals are beginning to mate and the birds are beginning to make some nests and things like that. It's interesting to watch flowers and leaves and all of it begin to come out. It's a beautiful time of year, isn't it? It's the time of year when everything should begin on the calendar, not back on January the 1st. These holy days picture God's plan of salvation for mankind. They tell us why man was created and why he is on this earth. There are many people who would like to know, why am I here? Why do they believe there is a God? They believe God exists? But what's the purpose of life? We see mankind basically uh, killing each other, dying of disease, all these things. And people wonder, well, what's the reason, the purpose? You know, it's a blessing for all of us because as we go through and repeat this every year, we get the answers. It's an incredible and beautiful thing. It was being talked about there in the sermonette. And we do need to stop and reflect a little bit on these things and how important it is. Well, I want to go through here and talk and explain a little bit about the Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread, as I do every year at this time, especially just before we're about to enter into them. And I want to begin with the Passover, because, of course, God's plan and reason why we are here begins with the Passover, with our Savior, uh, that sacrifice, Jesus Christ. Excuse me a minute got a cushion down here that's trying to get away on the floor. <laughs> Let me get it back there. There, that's better. I want to begin at looking at the Passover by going to the 12th chapter of Exodus and just review a lot of this because I think most everyone here has probably gone through this a number of times. I think this is my 55th uh, path. I've got a, either 55th or 56th. I got to stop and add that up again as far as which year it was, it is for me, and it is much more for many of you. Uh, but this is very good to go back and review. Uh, we're not always going through and looking at this <clears throat> through the rest of the year, are we? We do this in preparation coming up to the Passover. Here in chapter 12, verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. So we're in that first month at this particular time, and it is a very uh, <clears throat> interesting time of year. Now, you know, it began last Saturday evening, didn't it? Uh, last Sunday was the first day. Did I get that right? I believe it was Saturday because here the 14th uh, comes up Friday, and then the 15th begins when? Saturday night, night to be much observed. Uh, verse 2, this month shall be your beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his uh, father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house Take it according to the number of the persons, according to the, each man's need. You shall uh, make your count for the lamb. And your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. And you may take it uh, from the sheep or from the goats, it says here. So the lamb was taken on the tenth day. That's an interesting thing when you add it up or put the uh, numbers together there. Uh, the tenth day, all days, of course, begin at sundown and uh, end at sundown the next day, right? So when would you go? You have to find a lamb without blemish. So you need to be able to see the lamb. That means you don't go out and pick one out after dark. Uh, it's going to be on the day portion of the tenth day. So it's a half a day. And then if you count, of course, it, the tenth day ends what? At sundown. And the eleventh day begins. So 11, 12, and 13, that's three and a half days, isn't it? And at the end of the 13th day, what do you have? The beginning of the 14th day. And so <clears throat> it corresponds to the ministry of Jesus Christ, three and a half years. 
Uh, it's uh, really quite interesting. And of course, that lamb has to be without blemish, physically perfect as much as you can see with the naked eye, and uh, representing our Savior. Because, of course, that it, it is, he is that lamb, <coughs> represented by, uh, by that lamb. And the lamb is an innocent thing. You have a little lamb. Now, my, uh, when I grew up, we, uh, where we lived, we had several acres of pasture. And my dad, who was from the Midwest, Nebraska, was very familiar with raising sheep. And so to keep the grass down, he bought sheep. And... Uh, <coughs> And he had one ram, and I don't remember, uh, half a dozen or more ewes. And every this time of year, they're having their lambs. And it's always fun to watch these little critters running around out in the pasture when they finally they're big enough to out of the barn. And they love, especially in the cool of the evening, to start racing with each other up and down the fence line. Always fun to watch them. But there's a good example of something that is very innocent. Now, there were occasions where the mother, the ewe, would not accept the lamb she had just given birth to for whatever reasons. We would try to take care of that little lamb in the house. We had a box. We had a, a bottle with a nipple thing on it to feed that lamb. It was very difficult. Uh, we could feed that lamb, and it would respond. But, you know, uh, we lost them all because they needed to be with their mother. They needed that. Uh, they, being alone, uh, somehow they just didn't uh, didn't make it. And uh, but they were a, a, a very interesting little creature. Now I'm talking about just after birth. This is of the first year. So when you have a lamb of the first year, by the way, uh, if it is toward the end of that first year in its life, um, it'll be pretty well grown. And uh, because we would take them to market uh, in uh, August, and they would be pretty well uh, growing up. And uh, of course, then uh, they would uh, usually some uh, the packing companies or whatever uh, would uh, buy them. But uh, <clears throat> it is interesting watching, and then you read a little bit about this. And uh, those little lambs, especially when they were just shortly after birth, and and uh, the mother was not going to accept them. Uh, you try to feed them, and they will take the bottle for a while, but then finally after a while, you know, both my parents worked, I was in school, and so the, the, the creature was there alone. They couldn't uh, live alone, uh, be isolated. Uh, they really needed their mother and um, all of that. But anyhow, uh, when you talk about an innocent lamb, uh, certainly you did see that, and... Uh, uh, there's just something about it, and God teaches us these things through physical means, doesn't he? Um, you know, sometimes people have said, well, I don't want to have any rituals. I don't want to follow ritualism or things like that. And we shouldn't be, frankly, ignorant. You know, baptism is a ritual, and there is a teaching in it, and that we are drowning and putting to death the old self. But God teaches us things through physical means. You know, people did not always have the Bible. And uh, Middle Ages, they were, you might say, lucky if they could get a, a book of the Bible to memorize it. Literally, they had, would memorize some of the Gospels' uh, uh, accounts and uh, retain that. We read that about Peter Waldo, by the way, on the book of Matthew. And it changed his life. He didn't have, apparently, from what I understand, uh, the rest of the Bible, at least at the time he was uh, being uh, called and uh, his life was uh, coming to quite a change. Well, then we go on here in verse 6. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. <clears throat> now, that's a long word there in the Hebrew, and I don't know how to pronounce it or get it right, uh, so I won't try to um, uh, mention that to you. But when was this... <clears throat> this twilight. Now, some argue and want to say that, well, it's at the end of the 14th. Well, the end of the 14th is the beginning of the 15th. Uh, <clears throat> no, it has to be at the beginning of the 14th, which is at the end of the 13th. Uh, in verse 18, some will go to this, in the first month on the 14th day of the month at evening, 
you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. Well, that's seven days. That obviously is the beginning of the days of unleavened bread. Now, how do you explain that? Well, the word for evening there is not the same word as the word for twilight in verse 6. It's a different word. And it's talking about there at the sunset at the end of the day, which is then the beginning uh, of the um, of the 15th. The 15th will begin. Uh, <clears throat> but a lot of times this is used simply because um, uh, I'm not looking at the fact that we're talking about two different uh, Hebrew words there. We will be keeping it, of course, on the 14th and uh, <clears throat> at the beginning of the 14th, which comes this next Friday evening. Uh, let me read a few more verses before we move on. Let's go back here. Verse 8. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, and they shall eat it. Well, we don't do that because Jesus Christ gave us the new symbols. He did have that Passover meal. Uh, to what extent? Uh, it's always been a question mark and everything. Uh, he did tell them to go prepare for the Passover, sent three of his uh, uh, apostles, uh, disciples at that time to do that. Verse uh, 12, for I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now what night is he going to do that on? He's going to do it on the night of the 14th. Not on the night of the 15th. There are uh, in the Old Testament uh, 14 verses that tell us that the Passover is either on the 14th or that it was being kept on the 14th. There is not one scripture that says it's on the 15th. And uh, <clears throat> I know the, the Jewish people, as you do too, know that they will be keeping it at, uh, on the 15th, on next Saturday night, not next Friday night. Now the most important evidence we have of the 14th is Jesus' example that he kept it, there's no question that he was keeping it at the beginning of the 14th. There was no question from the apostles when they, he said, um, I want, to, who was it? I forgot which one, I think it was Peter, James, and John probably. Once you go in town, you're gonna see a guy, he's gonna be walking, when he comes to a place, tell, he has an upper room, and uh, tell him we need, to, need it for the Passover. It's interesting. Uh, which they did. We don't read anything about either the, the individual question. Well, no, you want it for the Passover tonight? It's, it's tomorrow night. You don't see anything like that. Uh, the apostles certainly, they never as well when Jesus said to do that. On the day of the 13th is when he told them to do that. And uh, <clears throat> so they understood it, obviously, throughout his ministry. They were keeping Passover at the beginning of the 14th. Uh, let me go on here a little bit more. Um, what else was instructed here to do? Uh, some of these things that we don't do today because we, well, we don't kill a lamb, we don't take a lamb we, or anything like that. Uh, on the night to be observed, uh, we, in fact, I understand we're going to have some lamb where we're going to be, and uh, I enjoy lamb. Uh, and uh, I, I... Uh, Sam's has a great deal on lamb chops, if you didn't know, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> and if you have the right marinade to put on it, they are delicious. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, uh, <clears throat> coming back here, let's go to um, verse 22. Drop down to verse 22, and you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood uh, that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. All right, so you're going to stay all night before you go out. And this will be uh, important later to uh, understand as far as when did they actually go out when they left Egypt. And uh, also as evidence and proof of what is the correct day and time on that day for the Passover. Uh, say verse 29. And it came to pass at midnight, midnight of what day? 
Well, the 14th, that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of livestock. So that would have been a very devastating thing to say the very least. Uh, verse 35 and 6, now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. Now I've wondered about that. I mean, uh, here's some, what my wonderment is. When you realize when they get out of into the desert, uh, and before they even got through the Red Sea, all the complaining and down the, uh, uh, the coast of the uh, Sinai and everything, and when they were out of water, wanted meat and all these things, oh, oh, go back to Egypt where we have leeks and onions and all these type of things, did everything. Nobody questioned Moses here. Do you notice that? What do you mean? that we have to kill this lamb and put the blood on the doorpost. I don't know. Look at the uh, Sabbath, Exodus 16. They were out there on the Sabbath uh, trying to find manna. You know, uh, and uh, that's why I, when I wonder, I kind of wonder, I guess everybody did exactly what they were supposed to do. It's just that it didn't last. I mean, they can, <laughs> uh, it wasn't long before somebody was trying to, uh, you know, uh, see how far they could go without, uh, you know, and get away with it or something. But not on the Passover. They all did exactly as Moses said there in verse thir uh, and instructed from God on verse 35. They had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, gold. Verse 36, the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they granted them what they requested. But the first part of verse 35, now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. Probably the only time they ever did, <laughs> which is amazing. And, uh, that, and certainly God blessed them for it in, in that. All right, uh, let's, uh, a couple things here that I don't want to take, uh, a few things I do want to mention uh, in the, uh, what it pictures here. Let's go to... Um, Isaiah 53, I know it's going to be read at the Passover service, so I won't belabor it too long, but I do want to uh, catch this verse because um, uh, of what it says we'll go to from there to the New Testament. In uh, Isaiah 53, verse 7, uh, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened uh, uh, not his mouth. He was like the lamb. And it's very interesting how all of this comes together. Now with that in mind, let's go to John 1 quickly. In John chapter 1, and uh, John the Baptist understood uh, uh, who his cousin really was. In John 1, 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Very clearly understood. And I think I've mentioned as we go through the book of Revelation, you don't see anything in there about uh, <clears throat> uh, referring to Jesus as the Christ. It's always the Lamb, always the Lamb in the book of Revelation. And uh, much of that comes back, of course, to the Passover Lamb. One other one here is in 1 Peter, 1 Peter, and uh, <clears throat> chapter 1, verse uh, 19 and 20. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Perfect, never sinned. Verse 20, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, for all of us. And uh, <clears throat> that says a lot right there. God had this in the works. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Well, he created the world, didn't he? He created everything that was created, John 1, 3. And, uh, <clears throat> and also uh, everything visible and invisible, he created, Paul said. God created it all, but as he says in Ephesians, through Jesus Christ, Ephesians 3, 9. You know, I enjoy, uh, well, I, I, I'm fascinated, I'm interested when I go out to West, and um, I know I think Mr. Walker was too last year, you see some of these places where these incredible 
creatures called dinosaurs were dug up. And you wonder about the Earth. Um, if things work out, we hope to take a vacation in June to be out there to the national parks in Utah and uh, all of that. But a couple of years ago, we were in Canada, Alberta uh, province. And in the town of Drumheller, the, Ryrie, the Royal Ryrie Museum is an absolute uh, incredible thing to go see. You, you can't believe it until you, you're there of what uh, they have uh, dug up all around that place. And you look and you, you know, there, there was a time, and the reason I'm telling you this is because what did it say? Before the foundation of the world, who created those dinosaurs? Jesus Christ did. And God did, but through him. There were ages. I understand there's no word for time in the Greek, so it uses the word eon, meaning ages and everything. But it's, uh, you know, there is no time in one sense for God. Time for us, and when physical things were created, uh, certainly you could say time as we know it began. Um, <clears throat> but... Um, now, what is time for us? It's the, what, rotation of the earth, the moon around the earth, and the two of them around the sun. That's how we calculate. What's time for God? Uh, is there in eternity really time as you and I would think of it? Uh, <clears throat> most likely not. So <clears throat> anyhow, coming back here, that's a fascinating scripture. Indeed, he, Christ, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Now, if you go up to Cincinnati, and uh, south of 50 miles there in Kentucky, where they have the big ark, that the uh, people behind that were the ones who, uh, the Creation Institute or whatever it's called out of San Diego years ago, and they were the ones that uh, produced the book that we used in second year Bible, as we call it, uh, <clears throat> in the first semester, going through Genesis and everything. They believe that, uh, of course, that the earth is only 6,000 years old and that all these creatures, because they have little dinosaurs up there as well, uh, and you go through it, it's a very fascinating thing, I've been told. I've, hopefully we can get up there to go through it. Sometime I do trust that they followed to the best of their ability the uh, uh, measurements and so forth listed on the ark in the book of Genesis. But the interpretation of the earth and all creatures that are extinct today that once lived on this earth uh, <clears throat> that we would disagree with. Again, see what an incredible thing it is. Foreordained before the foundation, foreordained before the ages of life that existed that does not exist today. And a long time ago, God has had a great, great plan. And that plan has been centered from the beginning on man, on man. It's a phenomenal thing, incredible thing. And here we are in the end of this age <clears throat> and awaiting the return of our savior to this earth. All right, moving along, let's go to Leviticus 23. I have something <clears throat> I want to um, add here on Leviticus 23. Well, not to it, but because of, uh, you'll see in a moment. Leviticus 23. <clears throat> and of course, all the holy days in, are listed here in the Passover to begin with. Verse 5, on the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And then the Fifteenth day is the beginning of the feast. I received a question here this last week asking me if I would explain because they said, uh, the individual said, I, <clears throat> I'm sure you will be speaking on the Passover this week, of course, a week before. And yeah, that's right, I will be. I am. Would you please uh, address how the Passover date is calculated? How does the vernal equinox enter into the scheme of things? Well, okay. <clears throat> I see a show of hands. Anybody want to <laughs> answer that? Well, I did some searching here, and I found it very interesting about the vernal equinox. Today is the vernal equinox. It is the spring equinox. It's also the fall equinox today. 
If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, this is the beginning of fall. In the Northern Hemisphere, this is the beginning of spring. So what is the equinox? The equinox is where the sun crosses the equator. Now, <clears throat> it, the Earth has been tilting back, right, ever since the winter solstice, going back the other way now. It's not that the, it's, the, the sun isn't moving, the Earth is moving. And now it's moving to the point where the sun crosses the equator to the northern hemisphere. And that is the spring equinox when it does that, which is today, which is today. Before I answer that question, the person asked, I would just uh, uh, thought I would uh, also explain <clears throat> a little bit about um, how, how does the world come up with Easter? Easter this year is on the... Uh, 4th of April, the day after the last day of unleavened bread, which is on Sabbath of the 3rd of April. <clears throat> the way that it was calculated, of course, and it began in the second century with the Quartal Deciman controversy because the Catholic Church at that time uh, did not want anything that appeared to be Jewish, certainly not the Passover. I have read in years gone by from Eusebius's recordings of what Polycrates and Polycarp uh, opposed it, uh, Polycrates going before um, Pope, well, I forgot his name now, and, uh, <clears throat> and for 65 years I have kept the Passover on the 14th day as taught by, to me by the Apostle John and all of that. Well, <clears throat> what was set up was that the Easter every year in the Western Church uh, was to follow the, I'm going to, well, I'll, I'll start with the spring equinox, the first full moon after the spring equinox, which by the way is next Saturday night, right? And then the first Sunday after that first full moon will be Easter. That's how they do it in the um, Western Church. But that's not how it's done in the Eastern Church. Theirs, I believe, is on May the 2nd this year, first Sunday in May. Well, now, why, how did that happen? Well, you know, there was a rivalry there back and forth as to uh, <clears throat> uh, who follows who. In 1582, Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, realizing that the Julian calendar first by the astronomers of Julius Caesar's time when he was Caesar, then of course they had to set up the uh, calendar to correct it, the Roman calendar at that time. So they, of course, would be named after uh, Caesar, Julius, and that was the Julian calendar. In 1582, it was off. I forgot the number of days. And so it needed to be corrected, and it was, and then it became known as the Gregorian calendar, and that's the one we follow today. But the Eastern churches didn't change the Julian calendar. They follow the Ju they don't follow the Gregorian calendar named after Gregory the Thirteenth. You see the humility there, of course, don't you? <laughs> and going on between them. So uh, that's why they are uh, a month later, uh, because the Julian calendar, those who are following it, and the Eastern churches do, uh, they're getting further and further away uh, and all of that. The seasons are changing. Now coming back to the man's question. What does the vernal equinox or this, uh, <coughs> have to do, the spring equinox, with the uh, Passover? Well, one of the rules on the calendar uh, and it's a very important rule to keep everything in sync, has to do with the spring equinox. That is, if the latter half of the first month, Nisan, that is the 16th day forward, is after the uh, <coughs> spring equinox, uh, let's see, did I get that right? Or next, no, before the spring equinox, then you have to add another month. It becomes a leap year. You have a 13th month, uh, and it's Adar 2, I believe it's called. So 
as far as what does it have to do with the calculations of the Passover, and the pa calculation of the Passover begins in the seventh month on the first day, in Molata Tishri, as it's called. And that's how, but they can see by both calculation, because the Hebrew calendar is both lunar and solar. Now what happened there when uh, uh, the um, uh, rabbis or Sanhedrin, they recognized that there was a problem if it was to remain solar, I mean, excuse me, lunar only. As I, in fact, I have it here, I looked it up. This one particular rabbi on the issue of the calendar said this, if you did not have that leap year and the Molad of Tishri, no, not the Molad of Tishri, but the uh, vernal equinox, that if, uh, <clears throat> well, let me just read it here and so I get it straight, hopefully. Uh, <clears throat> normally you have 12 months in the year on the Hebrew calendar, 29.5 days per month. Comes out to an average of 354 days a year. It may be one day before or one day after that number, but the average is 354. Therefore, if we were to maintain a strictly 12-month lunar calendar, we would lose 11 days each year from the solar calendar. This would result in holy days or holidays which would constantly be fluctuating in relation to the seasons, which are dictated by the solar cycle. We would have summer chanakas and snowy shavouts. What is that? Well, the Shanukah is in December. And he is saying we would have it in the summer. The Shanukah is a feast of dedications. It is mentioned in uh, John 10, 22, in the wintertime. What is the Shavat? It's a feast of weeks. Instead of uh, June, you would be having it in December. So they have to put that in there. Uh, <clears throat> Now, the month of the holiday of Passover always falls during the spring season. This is accomplished through 13-month leap years, which were added to the calendar approximately once every three years. And during these years, a second month of Adar was added to the calendar, became Adar II. Now, if the spring equinox would fall later than the first half of Nisan, then the year was automatically declared to be a leap year. You're safe this year. <laughs> Let me say that again. If the spring equinox, the vernal equinox, would fall later than the first half of Nisan, that is one through 15 days, then the year was automatically declared to be a leap year. Why? So that you keep it within the seasons. You keep it within the seasons. So, I don't know if I answered this individual's uh, question, but um, I gave it my best shot there, looked some things up. It was very interesting to me, and, and looking it up, too, I wasn't aware of that, uh, as far as that it was very important <clears throat> in determining whether on the calendar there was a leap year or not. All right, we come back here just to go on. I thought he asked me if I would uh, answer that, so I gave it a shot. Uh, <clears throat> I have uh, spoken on the calendar in the past, not here, and it's, I try to make it as simple as I possibly, because you can get pretty complicated on some of these things. And I might do that again in a Bible study or whatever, uh, go through um, the things about the calendar. It's also a very fascinating subject when you really see um, how the rules and all that God gave to the Jews in, in keeping that calendar and how actually it is probably the most perfect calendar there is. And it's over a 19 year cycle of time. Uh, <clears throat> but that will be for another day. Coming back here to today's subject. Uh, <clears throat> some will try to say and use Deuteronomy 16. I might talk on that at a later time because uh, <clears throat> I have spoken on that in the past to try to reason that the Passover should be on the beginning of the 15th. That is, not, it, 
Uh, once you understand what Moses was doing in writing the book of Deuteronomy, you, begin, you can understand, uh, no, he is not saying that the Passover should be uh, at the beginning of the 15th. The most important thing is that Jesus Christ has shown us that the Passover is on the 14th in Luke chapter 22, and I won't turn to that. Uh, you'll have that one at the uh, Passover service. But we see that the Jewish people kept the Passover one day later. Now, two important scriptures on that would be in the book of John. They are John 18, and well, let me just turn to it real quickly. John 18. And uh, verse 28, in John 18, 28, then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover, which was, of course, going to be that next evening but Jesus has already conducted the Passover with his uh, servants uh, <clears throat> the night before. The other one is in John 19, just turn the page and in verse 14. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, behold your king. So <clears throat> they wanted everything taken care of and when it, the uh, people down off of the uh, uh, crosses or the stakes, either way, that they were using there because you had two uh, uh, criminals there, on one on each side. <clears throat> and they wanted them down before the beginning of the Sabbath and the Passover that they kept, which was, of course, that evening at sundown. Well, Jesus kept it, and he is called our Passover in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. He is not called our Easter, is he? It's amazing how every year very sincere people uh, look forward to Easter. I was listening to the commercial on uh, uh, Fox yesterday, and it's a Baptist minister out of Dallas who sometimes is a commentator on Sunday mornings on uh, Fox, was advertising uh, something there for Easter and wishing everybody a wonderful Easter. And it seemed to be very sincere and all of that. And many people, I don't question the sincerity, but they certainly can be sincerely wrong. Well, <clears throat> nobody stops to ask, not, well, not only what is Easter, but who is Easter? It's a name. And what has it got to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? What does it have to do with anything with Jesus Christ? No, nobody ever questions it. Well, of course, I didn't question it either. Of course, I was pretty young. Uh, when I first began to, um, I would have probably been 17 years old when I first uh, uh, understood or even thought to question it. And I guess everybody's like that. They never think to question it. I quoted from a book by Lee Strobel here recently, and I've used some of his books, which are very good because of the research he goes in. And uh, <clears throat> having to do on uh, uh, Christ and faith, and uh, in that book somewhere, I got marked it, he makes a comment just off the, uh, about the Easter experience. And I remember when I read that first time, a man here was doing, frankly, a very excellent job of proving the point of the book. But then he makes this statement and just goes right on like everybody would and never, no question. Well, why didn't you look into that, Mr. Strobel? and uh, pro prove to yourself one way or the other. You know, what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> uh, people do, just simply do not recognize or even question. But that scripture, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, is a very important scripture to all of us. And that Jesus Christ is our Passover. He is the Lamb of God. He is not the Easter. Easter Bunny or anything like that. But uh, uh, these are things, points of truth, aren't they? We want to always cling to and to hold on to. All right, now let's move on past the Passover. I don't want to uh, let our ministers here who are going to conduct it uh, explain much more about it as you go through each part of the Passover next Friday evening. 
Let's ask this question, though. Who should participate in the Passover? Uh, that does come up every year. Should every single adult and child partake of the Passover? I've had people in the past, very new, and uh, you know they wanted their children to come and be able to partake of the Passover and you know have to sit down and explain it to them. I've had people come um, who you know were not baptized. They were ba they would well. I've been baptized. And it was by immersion, and uh, in whatever church of, uh, and, and that type of thing. Well, isn't that enough? And well, we'll take a look and see what it says here. Uh, first of all, let's go to chapter 12 of Exodus again. Exodus 12, and verse 43 through 48. In verse uh, 43, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it, but every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. Now this was the sign of the, in the old covenant, it began in Genesis 17, where it was given to Abraham. And uh, what is it, Leviticus 12, I think it was again there, re-established for all of the Israelites coming out of Egypt. Verse 45, a sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. In one house it shall be eaten, and you shall not carry any of the flesh outside of the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. Uh, drop down verse 48, and when a stranger dwells with you and he wants to keep the Passover, let all his males be circumcised. And he shall be a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. Well, what about today? Is that still the case? What if I told you yes? Let's go over here to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And <clears throat> verse 11 and 12. Paul writes, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So there is a New Testament circumcision, right? You know that already, I'm sure. But it's good to be reminded in case uh, people should ever say something to you uh, about it. And it is through repentance, baptism, and also the laying on of hands to receive God's Holy Spirit. Uh, <clears throat> we know in Acts 2, verse 38, uh, they asked Peter, what should we do? And he said, repent and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, uh, we have the definition of a Christian here, uh, one who has the Spirit of Christ, which is the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 8 and in verse 9, Uh, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his, not yet a Christian, because one does not yet have the Holy Spirit. And uh, <clears throat> that has to come through repentance and baptism. What kind of baptism should it be? I went to a prison to get permission to baptize a prisoner a number of years ago in North Carolina. And I had to go to the chaplain. She was a lady. And uh, she actually was uh, a, chap uh, a minister in the church I used to, that I grew up in, Methodist Church. And uh, so I talked with her and I explained that I had a portable tank and that I could bring. And I did use that tank in another prison uh, outside of the kitchen, you could fill it up. It's easy to empty and then fold up and throw it back in, in the car. Well, no, we can't allow that here in this prison. 
And, uh, but you can, you're, you're welcome to come here and either I can or you can um, dab the water on their forehead. Uh, of course, <laughs> nope, that won't quite work. <laughs> and, uh, but that's all it was to them. Uh, I have uh, run across ministers who think it's only, it's not necessary to repent and be bad. It's an option, it's fine option, but it's, it's not required. Uh, and uh, then I have people, who, like I say, in some of the, quote, mainstream uh, Protestant churches believe it's, uh, frankly, that uh, I should mention this too. I was baptized at the, year, at the age of one, I was told, in the Lutheran church. And my parents brought me up to the altar there in Sunday morning service, and I was told that uh, he put water on my head and said a few words or whatever as I screamed and bawled all the way through it. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyhow, uh, it wasn't until later, after uh, probably I was, uh, must have been 18 or 19 years old when I began to understand about repentance and baptism through the Bible Correspondence Course. And <clears throat> like all of us, we had to come to learn. In Acts chapter 19, I believe that this scripture is here for not only Christians, but for ministers. Because what would you do? I've thought about this down through the ages. Situations come up. And I look at the example here of Paul and this church. Let's uh, read here verse uh, 1. And it happened that when Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper chain regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, well, we haven't so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Well, he said to them, and to what then were you baptized? So they said, and to John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all, the beginning of the Ephesus church. <clears throat> all right, weren't John the Baptist's uh, disciples uh, God's true ministers under John? Yeah. Well, why did he baptize them again? Why didn't he just lay hands on them? No, he rebaptized them. And then he laid hands on them. And they received God's Spirit. A lot of times I explain this to people who insist that their past baptism, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, well, first of all, I ask them a little bit about what was that past baptism? What did they do? <clears throat> Was there any kind of explanation at all about repentance and counting of the costs and going through these things? What changes were you expected to be making to become a disciple of Jesus Christ? How much understanding and knowledge did one have? And uh, Paul had to teach and instruct here, and then he rebaptized them and uh, <clears throat> laid hands on them. <clears throat> he didn't just go out, okay, well, you've been baptized and everything, and I'm sure you were sincere, and you repented of what you knew and understood at that point in time. All we need to do then is just lay hands on you and pray that God will give his spirit to you. Uh-uh. That's not what he did. And uh, <clears throat> I've always used that personally uh, as an example uh, when these situations come up, and it's, well, I haven't had it in the last couple of years, but before... A couple years ago, it seemed like every year I would have one of these situations come up and I'd have to sit down and, and uh, explain to uh, people and uh, ask them a number of questions as well uh, about their uh, baptism, about the counseling, or what, what, what was it? Uh, I mean, it can really vary from uh, the different churches uh, when you get into talking to the people about it. All right, so one needs to be baptized, repent of their sins, accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for their sins in order to take of the Passover. And it needs to be the right kind of baptism. There needs to be the counseling for repentance, counting of the cost, immersion underwater. Baptism is a word, of course, as I think most all of you know, uh, in the Greek, untranslated Greek word, baptizos, and uh, <clears throat> meaning uh, that's how, what they did when they would sink a ship in a naval battle or whatever it is, uh, they baptized it, <laughs> and they went under. 
uh, immersion. Uh, much water was needed. For example, in John chapter 4, you find Christ is down by the Jordan River at the location he was because there was much water. Much water. Now, how did 3,000 people get baptized in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost? Did they all take a 20-mile hike down to the Jordan River? The only water source up there are two big pools. And uh, from the, uh, what is it, the Pool of Gihon going through the Hezekiah's Tunnel and empties out down, um, down the hill there. I'm trying to think, what is it? They, by the way, they just uh, excavated that, and uh, that was a beautiful pool when, in its day. Uh, <clears throat> that, um, oh, what's the name? Uh, uh, is it Siloam, isn't it? The Pool of Siloam. There's another pool, too, an upper pool. Well, obviously, they must have used those pools. Uh, I don't know what else, uh, 3,000 people. Uh, of course, what about the drinking water? Uh, they weren't afraid of COVID, uh, <laughs> that, uh, but um, they did have good sanitation laws, by the way, and uh, that the Jews did follow. Okay, let me um, <clears throat> go on here. I was uh, mentioning here about the, um, what did I say, the Passover. Now I want to um, conclude on this portion of the Passover, and then we'll move on. Again, this Passover is so important that God gave uh, two scriptures. And well, the first one is an instruction. It's Numbers chapter nine. I won't turn there. I'll just tell you about it. Numbers nine, verse nine through fourteen. The second Passover on the fourteenth. Uh, when is that? I, I need to look. We've, uh, it's uh, in May. No, I don't have it right. Well, I'll, we'll be telling if anyone misses a, the Passover. You know the way we have it this year. With uh, you can either download it and do it. You can. We'll have it here online live. Um, it's hard for. I, I, I begin to think. Well, I, I can see uh, some people like uh, Mr. Thompson probably won't be able to make it because of uh, his uh, situation. There may be some others, too, that because of um, uh, surgeries or sicknesses or whatever. And so God provides the second Passover. That's how important it is. No, nothing, you don't have a second Feast of Tabernacles, right? There's no second to any other uh, Holy Day occasion. And, of course, this is not a Holy Day, but it is a memorial, a memorial that we keep every year. Uh, the other scripture is uh, in Chronicles, Second um, Chronicles 30, and verse 2 and 3. Now, in that situation, the temple had been locked up, I think, for so many years, and Hezekiah was the one who, uh, oh, I don't remember all the circumstances. Anyhow, he, he had it onboarded. Uh, I believe there was a Hulda the prophetess also there that may have... Uh, one thing led to another. Anyhow, they found out about Numbers 9. And so you find recorded in Second Chronicles 30 that they, it was too late for this first Passover, so they took the second according to Numbers 9. So that's why it's recorded there in Second Chronicles chapter 30. Let's go to the seven days of unleavened bread. The feast begins with the night to be observed. We see that here in Exodus 12, verses 40 through 42. And this, of course, is different. You don't have to um, be circumcised uh, physically of the Old Testament or spiritually in the New Testament to be observing this. All of Israel observed the, the night to be observed because they came out of Egypt. And uh, <clears throat> so here in chapter uh, 12 and verse, um, get to it here. And verse 40 through 42. Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. It came to pass at the end of the 430 years on that very same day. Isn't it interesting? That means that 430 years before when this was given to Abraham that uh, it was on the 15th, wasn't it? Of Nisan. Yet it's not recorded as such in uh, Genesis. Uh, on the uh, very same day, 
it came to pass that all the armies of the, show, of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. And this is the night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generations. So, yes, the, it is not a commanded assembly in the New Testament church. It is something that is a tradition in the church that we follow. And uh, <clears throat> we have symbolically, in that sense, come out of what? Egypt, spiritually speaking, and uh, <clears throat> become a new individual and uh, to walk in a whole different way of life as we learn to put away, as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 5 there, the leaven of malice and evil and put on the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And uh, that's the life we want to live and follow. Uh, yes, it is something that we traditionally have a nice meal. And uh, it, it's... Um, I, I'm hesitant to say it is, a, a, it's not the Passover where we are a memorial, a solemn memorial to a death, which is what that is. But this is obviously because the Israelites did go out with a high hand, didn't they? And we should be able to enjoy a respectful and friendly and nice meal of fellowship with one another, or maybe it might just be our own family. Uh, we have to be more careful here because of the numbers uh, because of the, uh, the uh, COVID uh, virus and everything that we have going around. So we have to make uh, some changes a little bit on how l large of a group that we have. We don't want any large groups uh, <coughs> getting together. Some places you just can't, uh, uh, it varies from state to state based on whatever their regulations might be with this pandemic. Uh, <coughs> so this is the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The leaven should be out. And really you want to have it out on Friday, next Friday. Why? Well, you're, you're gonna put the garbage out and work on all of that on the Sabbath the next day. Now, if it didn't fall, let's say if it was in the middle of the week this year. Yeah, you wouldn't have to have the leaven out technically until uh, the, uh, the, uh, by the end of the 14th it should be out. But by the end of the 14th this year, which is the 14th is on the weekly Sabbath. So you probably, you want to get and use up your leaven. Sometimes people will, you know, have all this stack of leaven or breads and everything they got to throw out. Well, you use it up and quit buying it. Wait until the feast is over. And uh, <clears throat> you might start looking for some unleavened bread. Uh, certainly, uh, I've already bought a couple boxes at... Uh, uh, Publix, they sell it, uh, and uh, I think all over the state because there's uh, enough Jewish population here that, uh, and they sell it year-round too, by the way. So go to the international section of uh, Publix and you should be able to find unleavened bread or you might want to bake your own. There's a lot of wonderful recipes and things uh, that I've seen over the years. In fact, they had a nice... Uh, uh, fundraiser in Ohio when we pastored up there. And while we had Spokesman's Club through the winter, the women worked on that book, sent it out, had it bound up and everything, over 400 recipes. And uh, we still have it, I think, don't we? Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> it, was a, it was a bestseller, no. <laughs> uh, but uh, they do. Um, I didn't realize that when I was transferred to uh, Ohio that a pound cake is unleavened. And uh, we have this pound cake that was, this lady, she was probably uh, in her 80s and found out later she always liked to give the new minister her pound cake during unleavened bread. Well, this was uh, at, finished the first Holy Day service and here she came up with this pound cake. I think that's when she gave it to me. Mr. Haveley, I'd like to give you this cake and I looked at it, and I thought, I didn't know, any, I, I, I found out afterwards, that thing was really, it was a big, tall one, too. And I thought, how can it be like that and not have leaven in it? <laughs> and, and I'm saying, you know, what am I going to say here? i got to be 
because I, 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 I kept thinking, well, she ought to know that we don't, there shouldn't be any leaven here. And, you know, I knew she wasn't brand new in the church or anything. So finally, my, I think you told me, wasn't it, that uh, uh, <coughs> informed me that pound cakes don't, for the most, I guess you could put it in, but for the most part, they don't have, they can be stacked up high without leaven. And, uh, <coughs> and they're very good too, by the way. <laughs> Anyhow, coming back here. You know, it's interesting. We will learn at the Passover a little bit about unleavened bread in the sense that uh, John chapter 6, I don't want to take too much time to go in that. I'm going to let, wait and, for you to hear that. And you, you should go back and read John 6 before Passover as well. But you will find there that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. Now, what kind of bread? Leaven or unleavened? Jesus Christ is unleavened, isn't he? And uh, <clears throat> everything is to teach us something, to learn from the physical. Because there's been a time when God's people never had access to a Bible, as I mentioned earlier, and like we have multiple copies we can have. We are rich in that sense, aren't we? You think about how people, I saw the family Bible my parents had. It was this big thing, huge and heavy. King James Bible, that was it. If you got a family King James Bible in the 19th century, carried over and handed down to your children in the 20th century, um, now that was something. That was valued and uh, looked at, well, we buy Bibles all and order Bibles uh, of all kinds, you know, today, and don't stop to think how incredibly blessed we are in that regard. Well, we are to put out all of the leaven, and uh, <clears throat> certainly, well, what is the leaven? I think you all know anything with yeast, baking powder, and baking soda. I was just checking a couple boxes of things that we had in our house, and I found yeast in one. I wasn't expecting it, and I looked there, this stuff's got yeast in it. And uh, so uh, be looking around as you begin to do your spring house cleaning to put the leaven out. We have, if you probably already have started, but if you haven't, you've got plenty of time uh, to use up that which you know has leaven in it and to look around and see what uh, products you might have in the cupboard that use some sort, either, it will either say leavening or it will say yeast. And, uh, if, you know, like myself, a lot of times I don't always uh, uh, recognize it or expect it. And I happen to be just looking to see. One of the reasons I was looking to see was because I was about to, about to buy that same product again <laughs> and, uh, uh, that we were going to use. And it, it had to do with, uh, well, I'll tell you what it was. It was uh, <clears throat> I, I like bacon shake on my chicken and fix it up. And then guess what? That's got yeast in it. Well, maybe a lot of you ladies uh, already knew that. But anyhow, uh, <clears throat> so we learn every year something new. And uh, try this year to see if you can make it through without buying a hamburger during unleavened bread. I hear these stories every year. And uh, <clears throat> about, now I have to admit, I was out uh, playing golf with a couple other ministers in Ohio during the days of unleavened bread. We had just finished nine, it was hot, tired, we hadn't had any lunch, we're ready to make the turn to go out for the back nine. I go by the snack bar there and uh, <coughs> Uh, ordered a, a drink, and uh, <clears throat> I saw those turkey sandwiches over there, and I, I, I give me one of those too. And this other minister said, "You don't want that." I said, "Yes, I do. I want that." <laughs> and <laughs> finally, it dawned on me. You know, he was sending coded messages and everything. <laughs> but uh, we have to be on our toes, and. Uh, there is a spiritual lesson in all of these little mistakes and things that uh, may happen uh, <clears throat> at, during these days of unleavened bread. We later may laugh about it, but also there's a seriousness about it too. And 
as we think about it in terms of our life and uh, putting sin out of our life. So <clears throat> I won't get into a lot of things. We've had lists of uh, things that have leavening in them. If you have questions, I do have some lists at home. If you have a question about what is and is not leavening, that I can certainly pass on to you. But uh, <clears throat> certainly God wants us to have a joyous, a wonderful feast of unleavened bread in every way and in every respect. The key to a lot of this is preparation, isn't it? Preparation both physically and preparation especially spiritually for Passover and also for the days of unleavened bread. Well, brethren, these are all spiritual feasts we're about to come into. And like most things, God teaches Christians through physical acts. So let's be prepared for a very meaningful Passover and for a great feast of unleavened bread. <laughs> 